being the first African American um, impacts uh, St. Thomas? I think it's a it's a I don't know how that's going to the long term impact, but I think I think there is an impact there. Um, I just think about it on a very practical level. You know, at St. Thomas we have a, a parochial school with 325 children in it, and 85 percent of them are African American. You know, so. Mm -hmm. Having a leader that looks like them, I think, is is a good thing because I think everybody wants to have a leader um, that looks like them, you know, mm -hmm. or that they can identify with. I think about here in the Archdiocese of Chicago, you know, in our history, you know, there's only been 14 black priests ever ordained. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the first black priest, Father Augustus Stolten, he's up for sainthood in the Catholic Church, and um, you know, but I, I think it's I didn't meet a black priest until I be until I came to Chicago, you know. So even for me, having a having someone that I could like identify with is a really really important thing. Yeah, yeah. So you've been Welcome to Crooked Courage. It seems like we have been uh, missing in action for a while, but Crooked Courage is back and today we're excited. Uh, to have uh, Father Michael. Yeah, Father Michael Trail, yep. Okay, okay, I've got it all. We, we um, have Father Michael Trail with us, and we are so glad to have him. He is the new uh, priest at St. Thomas here, and he came aboard in July, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. and is now here in Hyde Park. So welcome to Cricket Courage. It's so good to have you with Thanks us. Thanks so much, Pastor Charlene. I really appreciate it. Yeah, so my first question for you, um, well, first of all, how would you like me to, to refer to you? Father Michael's fine, yeah. Okay, Thank okay. You. Father Michael, uh, so what did you want to be when you were a kid? You might want to have been a priest, <laughs> but I'm just checking in. No, actually, I didn't want to be a priest. Um, so before I wanted to be a priest, actually, I went to uh, college to be an urban planner. I went to Loyola University for undergrad, and I, I really love how cities come together. I think there's something very beautiful about the city of Chicago, the way it's um, it's so orderly in its design plan. You know, uh, Daniel Burnham really knew what he was doing, and I find that kind of stuff absolutely fascinating. Um, and that was my original intention when I, when I went to Loyola, but then as I uh, spent my first two years there, I just kind of thought about more like what was God doing in my life and how I could give my life back to the Lord. And as I was just kind of continuing on my own faith journey, priesthood came into mind. And so it was my sophomore year that I entered the seminary. I was 19 at the time. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And Father Michael, where, where are you from? Born and raised in Detroit, Michigan, uh, and then I came to Chicago in 2007. So I've been here almost 15 years at this point. So in many ways, Chicago is very much home. Yeah, I, I, I've been here over 20 years, so I can definitely relate to Chicago being home. Tell us a little bit about Detroit. I mean, we know about cars and we know about Motown, but I'm sure there's some other interesting things. You, know, you have to remember, when I grew up in Detroit, uh, Detroit was very different back then than how it is now. You know, everyone... I think anyone who looks at the news, they see Detroit as this big res resurgence of uh, economic boom and, you know, people moving back into the city. But when I grew up in the 90s and the early 2000s, uh, Detroit was very much on the decline. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the automobile industry had very much left the city of Detroit. Mm -hmm. uh, over 40 percent of the downtown was abandoned. And we're talking about high rises. Um, Detroit was very much a place where it was the suburbanization effect was very, very strong, where Anything that you wanted to do, you had to go out into the suburbs for. You went into the city either to work or to do some type of like city work or something of that nature. But then other than that, if you wanted to have any fun, you would go out to the suburbs. But now it's the complete opposite. You know, people are flocking into the city of Detroit. Um, it's, there's a real resurgence of people living in the city and lots of cultural things to do. You know, the the Pistons are now playing in Detroit. The, the Red Wings are now playing in Detroit. and. Growing up, they all played on the suburbs, so it's it's great to see uh, see the city that I grew up in it really become revitalized. It's wonderful. Yeah. Do you ever miss Detroit, or you know, thankfully Chicago and Detroit are only four hours apart, so I kind of get the best of both worlds. I always tell my my family and friends, even here in Chicago, that like I can work in the morning, drive in the afternoon, and then hang out with my family and friends in Detroit in the evening. So um, I try to go home a couple times a year. So in, in many ways, I I'm lucky that I have kind of feet in both worlds. I still have my, my family, my close friends there, I, but obviously my whole life is here in Chicago, so I, I get the best of both worlds. Yeah, yeah. And so what's your birth order? I assume you may have some siblings or you may be an only child. I'm an only child, yeah. I'm an only child. All right, I see you only yeah, child, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We get stigmatized a little bit. We do, right? We're all we're our own best friends. <laughs> Did you ever want to have siblings growing up? Or, you know, I used to say, I have some kids. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, sure, I mean, I guess. But I was very lucky that I kind of came from a large family. Mm -hmm. And uh, I grew up with cousins in a very tight-knit family. So 
we'd go to my grandparents' house on Sunday afternoons, and uh, I did. My cousins were like my siblings in many ways. Yeah, yeah. So, what's um, uh, some favorite holidays for you? Um, kind of an odd question because I'm usually working on the holidays. You know, <laughs> I don't think I've been home for Christmas in the last fifteen years or ten years. I think so. Um, you know, I but I really do enjoy Thanksgiving. It's a it's a great time. I mean, obviously, first to give thanks to God for all the blessings that we've received. Um, and Thanksgiving for me is my holiday for me to be with my family. Mm -hmm. um, on the church world, I really love, you know, the, the liturgies of Holy Week and Easter. Christmas is a wonderful season, obviously. Um, yeah, I mean, it just, I find myself being able to pray very, very easily. Um, and I find my prayer being, being very meaningful uh, during the season of Lent, the 40 days that lead up to, to Holy Week and Easter. Those are some very, very powerful times for me. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're you're pretty young, mm -hmm. and you know, usually when you see a priest or you meet someone in this field, they're a little older, sure. even older than me. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and you look really young yeah. and, and handsome and all Thank that you. Good, <laughs> good stuff. So, um, you know, what I mean, you can serve God in many ways. So, sure. what kind of called you to, you know? Tell us a little bit about that journey of, yeah, no, this is a serious call. Yeah, no, definitely. You know, <laughs> and, um, you know in, in our Catholic understanding, we believe that, that everybody is called to live out a vocation. And a vocation mm -hmm. is the way in which we're called to live out our, our, our dailiness of life and, and to serve God and to serve our sisters and brothers in the world. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you, uh, Pastor Charlene. There are so many ways that, that you know, people of faith can, can serve God, and, and they do so in many different facets. And they bring the, the gift of faith that they've been given into every single aspect and facet of their life, their, their professional life, their family life. But for me, you know, I think every single person has to fundamentally ask themselves the question, like, how am I called to be holy? And for me, this call to priesthood was the way that I understood that God was calling me to be holy, you know. Um, not to take away the holiness that married people live or professional people live as doctors, lawyers, or whatever profession they live. But this was like this call that the Lord put on my heart to like, this is the way that I can give back to the Lord. Um, and I'm, I'm very pri privileged to be able to do this because as a priest, you know, I, 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 get to I get to meet with people at very powerful moments in their life, you know, and just as you do as well, you know, moments when people get married, when, they, when there's a funeral, when there's uh, sickness in the family. Even just the dailiness of life and being able to, to bring a word to them, um, it's a very privileged moment. I take that I take that obligation very seriously. Yeah, um, it seems like to me sometimes that uh, people that feel called to be religious leaders have a particular vocation. Mm -hmm. um, some feel called more to the pastoral side. Some right. feel called more to the prophetic. Or, you know, one person laughingly says, "We all have one sermon." Right. Uh, <laughs> You know, we just preach it different ways. Exactly, right. right, right. So for you, what do you think is that thing that is burning, you know? Yeah, I think for me, for me, the, the burning thing is, the, the, the thing that gets me up every day and the, the burning thing is to be able to, to bring a message of hope and to, to allow people to have an encounter with Christ uh, through the church. Um, you know, I'm very lucky that at 32, I get to, I'm privileged to be the pastor of St. Thomas. We've, we've been around for over 152 years and I, I take that, that's a, that's a, that's a big weight and I take it seriously, but, but I, I love, I love what I do because every day is a different day, right? Every day is a new opportunity, one for my own holiness, but then every day is an opportunity for, for someone who crosses through our threshold, um, to, to have this opportunity to have an encounter with Christ each week uh, or every time they come to pray with us. And I think that's a, a wonderful privilege. You know, that really sounds good. Um, the message of hope. Mm -hmm. I, did that ever run low for you or how did you deal with that through COVID? I mean, we can't, we've come through some bleak moments, yes. you know, yeah. <laughs> in the last like two years or year and a half. Yeah. Yeah, I know you're absolutely right. I think, I think I worked harder through COVID than I think I ever had before as a, as a priest, you know, uh, and I think I work hard most days of the week, but you know, I think you, I think even in the darkest days of, of COVID, uh, you know, when we weren't sure what was happening and it was so new and it was very much a growing edge, I think what gave me hope, even in the midst of all that, was just knowing that people were looking to the church for this opportunity to seek some hope or some solace. And mm -hmm. even on my, even on my my lowest days, or even on the days where hope was like really kind of pining, I um, I always knew that there was someone who was looking to the church for for some some hope and some guidance. And I was like that that was my chance to kind of double down and to really kind of dig in my heels and know like, okay, like I'm doing the right thing, even even on the the, the 
darkest of days. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you do for fun? I mean, you seem pretty serious and you're smart and you're intelligent (laughs) and you're spiritual. What do you do for fun? Uh, For fun. I really, uh, you know, I love, I love the city of Chicago. I love going out with friends. I love going to restaurants. Um, I'm very much a people person. I love, I would describe myself as an extrovert. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I, I'm very blessed to have a good group of friends. Some are priests some many of them are not priests. Um, So I do a lot of that for fun. my own thing, I, you know, I, I love to read. Um, again, I, 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 because of my love of urban planning, I do a lot of reading around that kind of stuff like that. Um, I'm trying to think what else I do for fun. There's not a lot of hours that's it for fun, you know, when, when this kind of work, you know. Um, mm-hmm. I get one day off a week, it's Thursdays, and so Thursdays is really my day to kind of do self-care, rest, and recharge, things like that. Thursday's Monday outside. All right, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Here. I got some things in common. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, if you could travel anywhere in the world and you had a ticket sure. and money was no obstacle, where would you go? Oh, that's it. It's a good question. Um, you know, I've been very blessed to be able to travel throughout my years, um, you know, through college and through seminary. Um, I spent three months in Jerusalem and I would love to go back. Uh, I would love to go back there. For me, personally, it was a very powerful, transformative experience just mm-hmm. seeing the culture, uh, you know, living in Palestine. It was great. Uh, so that's definitely, I'm, I would go back there. Um, and where would I else would I go? You know, I, 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 would, I would love to go to Russia, actually. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'd love to go to Russia just to see it. You know, it's like, I think it'd be kind of cool. Yeah. yeah, it sounds good. So I was sharing before we started the video that I did try to Google uh, Father Trail up and <laughs> see what I could find. Yeah. Uh, not much, but I did see that your ethnicity is... Um, that you have some Puerto Rican in your heritage. That's right. One of your parents is Puerto Rican, That's and right. um, you mentioned bringing that um, to ministry. And so I wanted to ask you a little bit about what that has meant for you. How yeah, that... you, I, I, you know, my mom, my mom's, my mom's Puerto Rican. My, my dad's black. Um, my mom is of the generation where her, my grandparents came from Puerto Rico in the fifties. Mm-hmm. Uh, so she'd be the truly bilingual person in the household, um, and. W- that influences just, I bring that to me in my ministry, you know, um, you know, I'm the first, uh, pastor of color at St. Thomas, uh, in our history. And, um, I realized that that does have an impact and, uh, I, I bring my own culture. I bring my own heritage on both sides, my African American side, my Puerto Rican side, I bring that, uh, to, to the table. I have a, a couple of parishioners who are Cuban. And so it, it's been great to kind of connect with them, uh, in a different sort of way. That maybe they haven't been able to be connected with before, you know, to their parish. That, that's been a great um, blessing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think it is important. I think for so long, uh, people of color have often tried to kind of hide, right? You know, and I think it's good because who you are always opens the door for someone on some level to kind of connect with right. you. Right. So um, that's good too. Yeah. Um, and how do you think being the first African American? Um, impacts uh, St. Thomas. I think it's a, it's a. I don't know how that's going to the long term impact, but I think I think there is an impact there. Um, I just think about it on a very practical level. You know, at St. Thomas, we have a, a parochial school with 325 children in it, and 85 percent of them are African American. You know, so mm-hmm. having a leader that looks like them, I think, is is a good thing because I think everybody wants to have a leader um, that looks like them. You know, mm-hmm. or that they can identify with. I think about here in the Archdiocese of Chicago. You know in our history, you know, there's only been 14 black priests ever ordained. Um, mm-hmm. uh, the first black priest, Father Augustus Tolton, he's up for sainthood in the Catholic Church. And, um, you know, but I, I think it's, I didn't meet a black priest until I, be, until I came to Chicago, you know. So even for me, having, a, having someone that I could, like, identify with is a really, really important thing. Yeah, yeah. So you've been in Chicago for a while and mm-hmm. it feels like home, but you were on the north side for a long time. Yeah. So you're new to the south side. New to the south side and new to Hyde Park, yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> so are you like becoming a true south sider? Do you still have affinities? Like if you could choose which, you know, location you like better. Yeah, well, you know, I think, <laughs> I, you know, that's, that's a hard question because, of course, you know, as a priest, I have to go, I go where I'm sir, I go, I have to go where, I, where I'm called to, to serve. Right. And, um, you know, I, I just think on a very practical level, you know, when you're on one side of the city for such a long time, of course, you know, you begin to know know the area, you know, the community. Um, but even even in all my years on the north side, um, you know, I've ministered as a priest. Uh, out of my five years as a priest, I've ministered four of them on the north side. Um, 
even on the north side, it's still so varied though. You know, I was, before coming to Hyde Park, I was in Lakeview, eight blocks away from Wrigley Field. And before then I was in Saugan, which was on the northwest corner of the city. So again, mm -hmm. a very, very established neighborhood, um, very different than Lakeview. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, so the south side Hyde Park is still a new, new territory for me. Uh, I joke with my friends, the sun shines differently down here. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I, I'm looking forward to the opportunity to, to learn more about Hyde Park and uh, learning from my parishioners about the South Side culture and uh, mm -hmm. just seeing what Hyde Park has to offer. Yeah, yeah. So if someone were coming to town and they were stopping in Hyde Park and they have one day here, what, what would you recommend they just have to check out? Well, of course, they got to check out St. Thomas, naturally. <laughs> oh, that's good. Right. Um, no, but I will say besides that, though, you know, as I've, I've only been here for a couple of months and exploring the community, uh, seeing the university campus is absolutely breathtaking you know mm -hmm. it makes sense why it's like on the on the top 10 list of most beautiful campuses in the united states it's sometimes i just love walking through you know uh, -huh. uh so uh -huh. that, that's been a real joy um 53rd street obviously there's, there's a lot of fun things to do as well um but i would definitely say definitely checking out the university campus is just it's really breathtakingly beautiful it is it is and and i have to say fall is especially beautiful yes with the leaves and the, the buildings and the way the trees uh, grace the land is actually just gorgeous. Definitely. So, yeah. Well, thank you. I, I wouldn't have thought of that, but those are St. Thomas. Yeah, I might say United <laughs> Church. <but> <laughs> Naturally, <laughs> and I don't blame you if you did, right? <laughs> well, it's so good to have you here. I hope that people have learned a little bit about you. Kind of the purpose of our show is to help show the humanity of people, not so much, you know, okay. we already know that, you know, uh, uh, your journey on a professional level, but mm -hmm. just to try to show the humanity. So the last question I usually ask for people that are on our show is um, one thing that's on your bucket list, that one thing before you, you know, transition uh, through this life uh, that you would like to do? That's a good question. Um, that's, a, that's actually a really good question. Um, I think one thing I would love to do is... Um, I think so. I think as a priest, very often I live so much in the day to day. I, I don't think about the like, like what's the my personal thing because, for me as a priest, you know, like my, my yeah. a priest is who I am. You know, yeah. it's it's baked into, it's what I you know it, it's it's my identity. You know, so yeah. I I think about just kind of the day to day stuff. So I guess I guess on a personal level, what I would love to do is, I'd love to have like, six months and just kind of like. I don't know, sit on a beach and just like commune with the Lord, you know, <laughs> and even though I love, even though I love being, being a priest and love being a pastor, um, just like, you know, take, taking just some time just to, just for, for me and God, just to kind of sit and be, I think that'd be a lovely, uh, definitely a bucket list for me personally, I think mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. travel, you know, the travel aside, you know, there's always a chance to travel. I think there's always a chance to, to see the world and, you know, and as a priest, I'm very lucky that I, I have the flexibility to be able to do that, but I think there's there's something to be said about just taking like six months or a year and just kind of sitting with God. Mm -hmm. I uh, my my pastor. I, I I confess I do have a pastor, um, and it's Howard John Wesley of uh, Alexandria Baptist Church in mm -hmm. Alexandria, Virginia, Alfred really? Street. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. listen to him every week. Yeah, and um, um, FYI, his brother has a shoe store here. Just FYI. Okay. Oh really? Wesley is his brother. No yeah. kidding. Oh wow. Yeah. Okay. I have to go meet him then because. Like, <laughs> Uh, Pastor Wesley, uh, he did a sermon last January called Selah, you know, mm -hmm. where he wanted to sit and rest with God. And I, I, I found that very compelling. And I thought that was lovely that, that even for us as ministers, you know, we're all, we have to rest and commune with God because people do that. People come to us to, to sit and rest mm -hmm. with God. And I think, mm -hmm. I think, uh, Pastor Wesley had a very, who was very wise in that. And I, I mean, something to be said about, I guess that's why I put it on my bucket list. You know, this idea of just being able to sit and commune with God. Lovely. Yeah, I think a couple of years ago, he kind of shared in a vulnerable space mm -hmm. about just kind of his own crash and right. kind of needing to replenish. Yeah, it was like January of 2021. I remember it was just before the pandemic. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I remember thinking to myself like, man, he gets this like once in a lifetime opportunity. And then the pandemic hits and then, you know, us as ministers, we go into overdrive, you know, trying to be there for God's people. Um, but still just being able to take that time for oneself, I think is really important. That's why I really value Thursday. So take your day off. Pastor, yeah, you know? <laughs> I, I, I get good at it and then I get bad at it. Me too. Now I'm so good that I sneak a little something. Exactly. And, There's always an so, email to be read or to right, respond right, to. Right, right, yeah. right, right. Having that self-care is so important. It is, it is. Well, thank you for the service you provide to this community. 
for being on the South Side. Thanks. And um, it's good having you.